Hi, this is Mike Shea from SlyFlourish.com and Twitter.com slash SlyFlourish, and I'm the author of Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master. This is the fourth video in an eight-part series covering each of the eight steps for game preparation described in Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master. Today we're going to be talking about secrets and clues. Secrets and clues are probably the most powerful tool in this book, and they are a cornerstone of the eight steps. It's one of the most important steps, if not the most important step. They're uh, also likely the hardest step. They offer a tremendous value, but they're uh, also likely one of the hardest steps. I know personally they are the step that I spend the most time on uh, in game preparation, but they are a heavy refinement of the kinds of things that we need to run our game and uh, put together in a package that's as easy for us to do as, as possible. So what does a secret include? Well, in, in Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master, we define them as 10 things your characters could learn in the next session. So these are specific things that we think could get uh, dropped in front of the characters in the next game. Uh, we, we choose 10 of them and we write them down. Uh, you can think of these as uh, like tweets, right? They are like one sentence long, one or two sentences long. We're gonna actually take a look at a bunch of them today. But they're, they're brief. They're not long paragraphs of text. They're not big, big parts of the story. They're small, small components. Uh, again, like, like one or two sentences. Uh, they're specific and they're meaningful. These are things that the characters, that could matter to the characters. Uh, they uh, are not, we, we, we don't do secrets for everything. We don't, we don't do them for things that we don't think are going to show up in front of the characters. And in the examples, we may see some that aren't, are actually not very good. So we'll, we'll, I'll note those when we're looking at them. Um, but they're ways for us to define the world and define what's happening in the world in a way that we can drop easily into our game so that our players can see what's going on with the world. Uh, one major feature of a secret is we don't define how they're going to discover it. Uh, what this means is we've created a tool that helps us prepare to improvise. So the reason we don't tie it to a specific thing is we kind of don't know what the characters are going to look at. We don't know where they're going to go. We don't know which one of the clues they're going to pick up when they're conducting a murder investigation. Or if they're going into a tomb, we don't know which direction in the tomb they're going to go. So instead, we keep the secrets abstract from how they're discovered so that when players make a choice, we can kind of look at the choice they made and drop a clue in. They're, they're almost magical this way. They really feel, when, you, when they work well, they feel magical because the, the play, everyone at the table kind of recognizes that this thing that just happened, this discovery that just occurred was improvised. It wasn't planned. They, they can kind of, the players can kind of tell that you didn't plan it. But then all of a sudden they learn something really useful from this thing that they had. So they, they smash down a wall and they find an old mosaic and they're looking at the mosaic and the mosaic is telling them things. They're like, wow, look at that. I've, I've discovered a little bit of history about this place that I didn't know before. And they're like, how did you know we were going to smash that wall down? And you're like, I didn't know it, but I knew that the history was one of the things that you might discover. So uh, that is a really, a really powerful uh, advantage to secrets. Um, so if you think about uh, what makes a good secret, I, I already mentioned that they're short and I mentioned that they need to be meaningful to the characters. These need to be things that are, are gonna matter. That doesn't mean it has to be like only things that are happening today. Uh, history is a fine thing to put in a secret and clue. If you want, if you want to uh, flavor the depth of the dungeon they're going into with old pieces of lore, uh, you can do so. But a really powerful trick is to connect it to the character's background. So if the character has a history of, of working with the Fae and, and has this connection to the old elven gods, if they're in a temple and uh, they break through a wall and they find an old mosaic, seeing information about uh, the gods that this character knew about, but learning something about those gods is going to be really meaningful to the player who discovers it. So another great trick, if you can, is try to tie, you don't have to do it with every single one and you're not, it's going to be hard to do it with every single one. You know, you'd have a real hard time. We, I, I would have a really hard time, but many times a secret include can be directly connected to the background of a character. And that means it's going to mean more to the player when they discover it. So that's, that's very powerful. So the kinds of things that you can bundle up into a secret are all sorts of things. Uh, history, you know, and we talked about like ancient history to recent history can all be, uh, you know, packed into a little secret and clue. Uh, old lore, you know, a bit of folklore that, that got out there. Rumors are good ones too. 
Uh, I tend not to do false ones, but you could say like some people believe X is true when it turns out X isn't really true. Uh, current mysteries, right? Like who, who, who done it, right? Who was it that broke into the window or who saw somebody breaking into the window? Who knew that the person they were supposed to be going on a date with disappeared the night that somebody broke in the window? Those can all be sort of secrets and clues that you put out. Uh, foreshadowing. Uh, is a great one. You know, what are elements that you can drop in as a secret or clue that can kind of give hints to the characters of the things that are going to come up? That's really powerful. Uh, character connections. You know, again, I, I, I talked about uh, uh, a character's connection to the old gods or to an old city, or, you know, if a character comes from a particular tribe, you can put in secrets and clues that further define the connection that that character has. But it can also tie them to things that are going on. If the character... Uh, you know, if the local rogue in the group has the eye of the Assassin's Guild, you know, the secret could be that the Assassin's Guild is actually trying to figure out how to recruit them, right? Uh, th those can all be valuable. And then information on villains. One of the problems we have with villains in D&D is many times you will drop in a villain only when they are in combat. And then the, you've been thinking about your villain for months, but the players have only seen him this one time. So one great way to sort of make a villain uh, um, omnipresent is to put... Uh, lots of secrets and clues that foreshadow the villain, that tell about the villain, you know, that, that where you can learn about the villain well before you get into the situation of actually facing the villain in combat. So those are good ones. So why do we pick 10? Um, we could have picked three or five. 10, 10, I picked 10 because it's, um, it's an arbitrary number. So, you know, feel free to use more or less, but I'll explain why I picked 10 and then you can decide based on that. And I would suggest trying 10 and see how it works and then go from there. But uh, you want enough of them that you don't ever run out, right? You want enough that in your game, you don't kind of run into a situation where they've discovered everything and you don't have anything left for them to discover. So I try to leave some secrets and clues on the table or, or I try to keep them in my, in my book uh, without having used them so that there's always more mysteries I can drop out. And in a four hour session, they're not likely to get 10. In fact, my, my own sort of look at how many secrets come out, it comes out to about five. Usually about half of them get exposed. Uh, so um, the, the other interesting thing about 10 is I can usually come up with about seven pretty quickly. And many times if you're running an ongoing campaign, you'll sort of have secrets and clues that, you, that sort of come from session to session. Um, but 10 is hard. And usually by the time I get to about seven, I have to really think. And then those, you know, oftentimes clues eight, nine, and 10 will be really interesting because I had to push my brain out of the ones that I already kind of knew about. And it kind of like, oh, you'll, you'll get these sudden, you know, sudden bouts of inspiration that uh, kind of take the game in a different direction or ideas in a different direction. Sometimes they're, they're goofy, but sometimes they're really cool and they actually are more powerful than the ones previous. So 10 is enough to really kind of stretch your brain and uh, make you think uh, pretty far out about your campaign, not, not like in history or in, in you know, distance, but just in, in its overall scope. So, so that's why we picked 10. Uh, another trick, and this is uh, something that I get a fair bit of questions about, is what do you do with the old ones when they're not used? And my answer is throw them away. Like I keep them in my notes, but I don't really review old secrets and clues. And the reason why is it's a valuable exercise to come up with new ones every session. And part of that is that the game is evolving. So we don't want to hang, we don't want to anchor ourselves to the past when we're, when, when our game is going in many different directions. It's almost better to kind of start fresh every session and say, okay, now which secrets and clues matter, right? The character's focus has changed, their interests have changed, the direction the game has changed. Let's come up with new ones every time. So it's a temptation and, and, I've certainly done it. Uh, I've done it in my prep videos that, uh, that I've recorded elsewhere where I'll, I'll cheat and I'll go back to old secrets and clues and kind of pass them forward. But generally I try to avoid that. And I try to uh, instead come up with new and interesting ones each time. Even if uh, sometimes they're not new and interesting. Sometimes they are old and I just write them down again, but I, they're so ingrained in my head and they're still relevant so they will come up. So to me, a good secret comes back. You know, Stephen King talked about ideas and he said that he doesn't really record good ideas because if it's good, it'll stick with him and he can't get rid of it rather than having to go look through old notebooks and find them. Uh, I think secrets are the same sort of thing that like a good one is gonna stick around and bad ones are best just left behind. You don't need to have a big database. You don't have to have a giant spreadsheet with a thousand secrets in it. In fact, it's kind of unmanageable to do that in the first place. It's better to just worry about the 10 for your next game and come up with 10 each time you're doing your session, even if it does require a little extra work. So, so that's a big one. So why don't we take a look at a few secrets now and see where it's going. Uh, so in the chapter, I'll just do a quick review of the chapter itself. Um, 
So, you know, we, we mentioned the fact that uh, this is all in chapter six of Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master. And um, we mentioned that they're abstract from the places of discovery. We don't, we don't worry about them. Uh, we don't worry about where they're going to pick them up because that's part of the inspirational. That's, that's the improvisational piece. When we're in the game, we can improv where they show up. Uh, we do 10 per session. Uh, they aren't always revealed. Um, they only become real when they're revealed, when they're ethereal, when they, we haven't shown up, they can be destroyed. They can be wrong and we can throw them away. So the world is ethereal until the characters interact with it and then it becomes real. So that's a, that's a big one. And, uh, a lot of times we talk about like having a list of quests for the characters and secrets and clues are kind of like, kind of like quests. So, um, so that's one way to do it. So there are, there are 10 example secrets in, uh, Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master, but we're gonna we're gonna skip that and we're gonna jump over to some secrets that are actually from games that I've run. Uh, so uh, this was one from Waterdeep Dragon Heist. This is relatively recent. I don't even know if this is yeah. It looks like it's about ten. And um, the uh, this is early on in the adventure, so uh, some of these aren't gonna make complete sense because they were very contextually specific. But the escape hall beneath Peabody's house hasn't been used in a century and it's very old and fiendish. So the idea here was that the characters ran into like a hallway that was connected to a cellar of a, of a, of a, of a, a person's house. And the concept was the, that place was actually much older than the house that was there, right? And that's a little bit of kind of interesting uh, flavor to give. It's not, it doesn't reveal something really important. Um, it's a bit of foreshadowing, especially the fiendish nature. The The whole theme of the campaign that I'm running for Waterdeep Dragon Heist has a high amount of a focus on the nine hells and on uh, uh, the fiends that exist. Uh, and as you'll see in the next secret, it's very true. Hell is bleeding into Waterdeep like water bleeds into cracks in a cellar. Again, that's that's trying to make sure the atmosphere of the game is, is clear. And they could figure parts of that out. They could talk to a sage and the sage could tell them. They could read it in a book. They could have a premonition. They could just do a religion check and, and feel it, you know, or they could see a, something. There's so many different ways for that to come about. Someone somewhere is committing terrible atrocities to bring hell so close. So that's another bit, you know, priests could tell them that, or, or they could, you know, there's lots of different ways for them to kind of learn. They could have a dream about it. They could, you know, I, I think the way this one actually manifested was that they contacted their, their pay, a warlock contracted their fiendish patron, uh, and the patron showed them a contract that didn't have the names on it that said, look, here are a bunch of people that sold their children for money to us, to, to the Nine Hells. Uh, the Xanathar has attention on Floon and Raynar for a big reason. He does not waste his attention on trivial matters. So this this is one to kind of say like, hey, something important is going on. We're not telling you what's important yet, but if the Xanathar is paying attention to it, that means it's really big. Uh, other spies are keeping an eye on Raynar. They disappear when approached. Uh, so this is, you know, we want to hint that there's lots of different factions that are going out. And again, lots of different ways that this could, that this could happen. Uh, it would seem that the black staff has re-enabled the gray hands, her own network of spies and investigators, and she is worried as well. So lots of different things are going on in Waterdeep. And this is another one. And this one is important because, uh, the characters have a little bit of a connection to the black staff and to the gray hands. So the fact that they're fired up again, now we can kind of bring that into, into play. Uh, many believe the current Blackstaff is too young to understand the political subtleties of Waterdeep, merchants, nobles, and the Master Lords and the Open Lord, and some expect her to blunder. This gives us some information about one of the NPCs that the characters can figure out. And again, they could hear it in a bar. They could learn it from a guard that they're talking to. Lots of different ways they can pick that up. But it kind of fills out one of the NPCs. Uh, someone was covering the tracks of whoever leased the warehouse and what was inside. This is this is like a part of a mystery, right? If they can figure out who leased the warehouse where uh, Raynar Neverember was kidnapped, that can start to lead them down to figure out which one of these houses they have to worry about. Uh, and here we go again. Two years ago, the warehouse was paid for by the Grauhan family. So now we know that there's a noble family that two years ago paid for this warehouse. Um that helps us, you know, that gives us clues that we can drop for the characters so they kind of know, you know, maybe we should investigate that Growlin house. That might be something to that. Uh, the walking statues weren't always visible. That only happened recently. Only the black staff can control them, and she has sworn not to. Uh, doing so could destroy the city. What is more dangerous than the statues walking? So this is about the history of the city, uh, particularly, particularly uh, its valuable for when they see the statues, they can learn more about them. Not, you know, you, you can see the difference in, in the context of these secrets that, you know, learning about who leased the warehouse where Raynar Neverember had been kidnapped is more specifically relevant than what's going on with the walking statues. But, but the walking, the learning about the walking statues kind of helps enrich the world, which is a big part of what we're doing. We don't want to read 
a 5,000 word essay about the history of Waterdeep, but we can give them a little hint about things. We can just say like, let's just, let me tell you a little something about these walking statues. So those are, those are examples from um, a recent Waterdeep Dragon Heist game. Uh, we'll now jump to a set of secrets that we, uh, that I wrote for um, Tomb, Tomb of Annihilation. So this was deep into it. They were deep in the middle of a dungeon. And these are the kind of secrets and clues that are gonna matter then. And uh, this is a good example of um, when, you know, you're almost, I don't want to use the word tactical, but like, you know, the scope of the adventure is much more narrow uh, in this circumstance. So uh, lots of these are just important things they need to know about the dungeon in order to navigate it. Level three requires 10 crystal eyes to enter the final chamber, right? They, they can figure that out by seeing it, but they might hear about it too. Five skeleton keys are needed to enter the cradle of the dungeon. So if you want to finish it, you're going to need all five keys. Uh, the tomb serves two purposes. Those, those are very logistical in, uh, pieces of information. The tomb serves two purposes, to channel the negative emotions of its guests and to cradle the unborn god of death. So that's not as important as the other two secrets, but it definitely tells them like why this place is the way it is. Uh, here's another bit of flavor. The corpse in the safe room starved to death. Uh, they didn't want to ever leave that room and died there. This kind of makes the tomb feel so dangerous. Like here's a person that found a safe room in this dungeon and they just stayed there until they starved and died. They never wanted to leave again because the rest of the tomb is so horrible. So that's kind of foreshadowing. That's kind of giving uh, f a flavor to the overall dungeon. Not critical for their understanding of how to get through it, but it kind of tells them about it. Um, here's another kind of you know s s far off ones. Uh, a Sarak stretches time in the tomb to get the maximum amount of pain of its inhabitants. So this is one where like you might have only been in there you know, the, the, the time you've been in there might actually have been 100 years, even though outside it's only been 10 days. And the reason why is that a Sararak draws pain out of people. How do they figure that out? They could be an Arcana check. It could be by looking at, they go back and see old tracks that they have, but the tracks look like they're 100 years old. So lots of different ways that they can figure out exactly uh, what's happening with this. You know, there are lots of, lots of things that could occur. Um, and then we have a bunch about the Sown Sisters, right? The sisters don't care what happens level one to four, uh, but they do care, but they like to put nightmares in people for fun. Sisters have spies uh, that can follow people, toys, ants, and whatnot. Uh, the sisters have dolls that are possessed by the souls of children. Um, some of these I never came up, like the, the whole dolls being possessed by children never really showed up in, in, in either of the campaigns I ran. Uh, and Aserak has many plans, and this is but one of them. He plays the long game. That's a villain thing, right? Aserak is a huge, powerful arch lich. He's not just worried about you, and he's not just worried about this tomb. He's got lots of things going on. So those are examples of a, of a more tactical one. But you can kind of see that the scope on them is wide and, and focused. You know, there's lots of different ones. So now we're going to jump to a whole different game completely. Uh, we're going to jump to Shadow of the Demon Lord. Um, uh, Shadow of the Demon Lord is a role-playing game done by Rob Schwab, um, who worked a lot on fourth and fifth edition of D and D. Uh, it's a very, you know, it has a D two, it's a D twenty game and has a, a dark fantasy uh, feel to it. And these are ones that I actually just wrote today uh, for a game that I'm running uh, soon. So uh, the first one is sort of like a quest. Father Gregory has gone missing. Uh, word was sent out to the church of the new God to let them know, uh, and they're sending someone. So this has a few, you know, that's three sentences, right? It's a little long for a secret, but you know, hey. And A, it's a quest. Oh my God, Father Gregory is missing. Father Gregory is a member of the church of the new God. And some people who found out that he's missing went to the church of the new God and said, hey, he's missing. And they're sending people. What's interesting to me is the people they're sending could be even worse than the people grabbed at Father Gregory. Like these could be inquisitors and, you know, um, Templars who are ruthless in their attempt to try to find out what's going on with Father Gregory. Uh, members of the Rude Boys. Rude Boys are like a gang. Uh, have been watching the Moore House. So there's a house that I, you know, where we want to draw attention to in the game. And it turns out that there's some gang members who've been watching this house for some reason, but why, right? Uh, a week or so past cloaked and hooded figures emerged from the Moore House. Again, we want to kind of steer attention to the Moore House with a few clues that say there's other people spending their time and attention on the Moore House. Maybe you should too. How the characters learn this, they could just pick it up from a, a, someone in the street. They could see it themselves. You know, they could learn it a bunch of different ways. Uh, the well in the center of grievings, grievings is the name of a neighborhood here. Uh, the well in the center of grievings used to produce fresh water, but the water has gotten tainted since the coming of the red star. Uh, the red star is a, is a, uh, precursor in my campaign that I'm running here that I haven't even started yet. Um, the red star is a precursor to show that the shadow of the demon Lord is coming to roll. It's coming to this, to this world. And, um, the red star, since the red star showed up, bad things have been happening. And one of them is that the water in the well got tainted. Uh, shady characters have been lurking about in the uh, ruined buildings. That's not a great secret. 
Um, and it's not because it's not real specific. It doesn't really tell us anything. It's just saying lots of shady people are hanging around. Uh, the next one is better. Rumors say that the Black Hand of Azul, also called the City of Death, have come to crossings. So now we know that there's like a guild of assassins who actually sent some people here. That kind of tied into the shady characters are lurking around the buildings, but more to the point is like they're, the guild of assassins has spies in this town, maybe, right? Uh, the Inquisition of the New God have begun to arrive from seven spires, their holy city. Some think they will purge villainy from crossings. Others think they will raise it to the ground. So now we, we you know, there's, there's all sorts of dark cults and evil groups of uh, you know, evil groups of folk that are uh, in crossings doing terrible stuff. But one of them could be the cult of the new God, the church of the new God, who are sending in these shining armored Templars that are just as murderous as everyone else because everyone's got sin in them and they're gonna wipe it all from the face. So face of the town. So that could be a really interesting secret. Uh, the mages from the Occlusion. The Occlusion is a wizard tower that sits on the edge of crossings, at least in, in the version I'm doing it. Occlusion in the book is far away, but I'm putting it right next to the city. Um, uh, mages from the Occlusion are always quiet, but they're always watching. You never hear from them, but they're watching you. Uh, they have people everywhere and they have eyes everywhere. Uh, Caden Fenn, a seller of oddities, has spoken about wanting to join the mages of the Occlusion. He believes they have learned to, uh, how to live forever. So this is a little bit of NPC background. I just want to introduce an NPC that has like a tie to the wizards, to the mages of the Occlusion. Uh, and I think that could be cool. Uh, and then this, that last one is a nice important one. Someone saw four cloaked and hooded figures sock Father Gregory in the face and drag him into the Morehouse. Sometimes we want to have a secret clue, especially if our character, our players are having trouble figuring it out. Here's the one that they could discover. It's like, yeah, you want to know where Father Gregory is? Well, some people punch him in the face and dragged him into the Morehouse. Maybe you should go there, right? So these are, um, this, this kind of shows that you can use these secrets and clues for all different kinds of games. This is for Shadow of the Demon Lord, but you could just as easily using, use them for... Um, uh, yeah, they, they, I, I wrote them primarily running D&D &D games, so they obviously work well in D&D. &D. But I think that they are a powerful tool for pretty much any RPG, anytime you're running a session of the game. Um, so uh, just a quick review. So secrets and clues, we do 10 of them. Uh, we make them short and we make them relevant to the story and relevant to the characters, things that will be interesting for the characters to discover. We don't worry about where they're going to be discovered. We, we let, we improvise where they're going to be discovered during the game. We drop them in when they make sense to drop in. Um, and, uh, we want to, we, you know, we want to make sure that they, uh, that we, we give ourselves the time to think about them. We do 10 because, uh, it can be hard to do 10. Um, and we don't really worry about letting them carry over. Much like all of the other steps in Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master, our, our main focus with them is how are they going to be valuable in the next session? A lot of times we want to think about the whole campaign. We want to go, where is it going to be in six months? You really don't, like, I'm, I'm running this Shadow of the Demon Lord game, and it's 10 sessions long, so it's, you know, two to three months of gaming. And I kind of have a real loose outline about where it's going to go. But the main thing is, like, what are the 10 secrets that matter in the next game? And that's why I've got these. So uh, I know we spent a fair bit of time here on secrets and clues, but I do think it's a really powerful tool. So I wanted to, I wanted to really dig into it. Uh, I, I recommend taking a look at uh, the chapter in Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master. Uh, you can see uh, old, you can see videos where I've, I've gone through and defined secrets and clues for the games that I've run in my YouTube channel. Uh, so if you want to see more examples, I did, I, I don't know, I got 50 videos of it looking at secrets and clues. So there's lots of talk there, but hopefully this video was useful for you. And in future videos, we will cover the remaining four steps. So thank you very much.